Thank you, everybody. I want to thank all the presenters. I, I want to thank for everybody trying to maintain some level of decorum in the room. Um, so we have the, the Q&As, as I said earlier. Uh, we all have staff in the room here. If you want your question added to the list, if you raise your hand, and they will uh, leave you a form. So we're going to go through the Q&As one at a time. We're going to alternate through through them. Um, before we do start, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, David Sagnacki. David is running for the mayor of the city of Toronto next October. Thank you. Thank you. So I am going to start with the first question, uh, which I guess will go to city staff. What are the percentage of Toronto population currently using Billy Bishop Island Airport? Um, hello? I think you can hear me. Um, we, we don't know what percentage it is, uh, but I can tell you that in 2012, there were about 2.3 million passengers who, uh, who utilized the airport, about 2 million who began or ended their trip uh, in Toronto, and about 300,000 who transferred, who, who didn't leave the airport. Um, I believe the population of Toronto is about 2.3 million. 2.8 million, I'm told. Beyond? If I can answer that question, I'd be happy to. Uh, the recent polls show that one in three Torontonians has used the airport, and that the average user uses the airport 7.4 times. It's a heavy user-dominated airport. One in three Torontonians. Okay, the next question, I believe, well, I think it's for Porter. Uh, I live in Highland Creek in Ward 44 and have jets from Pearson flying over my house. If Porter operates jets from YYZ, will that not increase traffic over my house? presentation um, in terms of indicating current uh, flight paths of uh, Q400s. Uh, about 10% of them actually fly over Scarborough, but they do so at fairly high altitudes, uh, generally uh, in the 4,000 uh, foot uh, above ground uh, or uh, 4,000 foot altitude or higher. Often, uh, if those aircraft are taking off toward the west and they do their left turnout, by the time they swing back toward the east and cross the shoreline uh, before heading north to one of those uh, destinations uh, in northern Ontario, they're as high as uh, 10,000 feet. The CS-100s, none of them are planned uh, to fly uh, over uh, Scarborough, so there should be no added impact from uh, the CS-100 uh, aircraft. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, one of the slides I was a bit intrigued by uh, uh, which I think speaks volumes, and that's the uh, one that showed the uh, Pearson flight paths. They're pretty un, uh, unconstrained or in, uh, not constrained in any way. A lot of the aircraft that do come over the area are in fact uh, uh, heading to or from uh, Pearson. We deliberately uh, avoid flight paths that uh, uh, will have us over shoreline, and when we do pass over shoreline, we're appreciably uh, uh, higher than most aircraft and uh, with uh, little of any uh, impact on the Scarborough area, and that will continue in the future. That's not true in the saga, Robert. Thanks, Robert. So they support the airport in its current state. Then they say they want to close the airport down. Which is it, and why should we believe you when all your statements contradict each other? We have never said close down the airport. Go on our website, read our statement. It has never been said. Well, although what has been said in, in Porter ads, 
those $40,000 full page ads that you see on and on again, is people are fighting to close down the airport. I'm sure they are. They're, they're, I'm sure there's four people here that want to close down the airport as well. But no jets TO, the major opposition to this expansion, wants to fight the expansion and the expansion only. This airport remains as is. Absolutely. The, uh, the next question is also for No Jets. Um, what are No Jets' uh, views on technological advancements to overcome hurdles that they've identified? Well, I, I think the plane itself is, is great. It's a, it's a great piece of technology, and, and it's a point of pride for Canadians that it's coming from a Canadian company. That's not what we're discussing. We're not discussing that. This is not a matter of technology. This is not a matter of thing. This is a matter of the footprint of an airport. It's like asking this auditorium to increase into classrooms and say there will be no impact on classroom space. It doesn't make sense. So the technology aside, we need to keep our focus on what's at stake. The airport should remain within the footprint that it was allowed to be in. Now, Mr. Deleuze wants to expand. There is an airport with capacity to take him in with open arms. Anyone know what it's called? Pearson. Thank you. It's called Pearson. 35 million passengers last year, 50 million passenger capacity, 400 million being spent on another runway expansion that has already been committed, our taxpayer dollars. So let's expand there. Thank you. The next question is the resident. Flight curfews are being violated. How do you explain this? And what can be done to, I believe, protest? I guess what flight curfews are being violated, and can you explain this? I can tell you is that uh, Porter does uh, its absolute utmost to respect the curfews uh, that exist at Billy Bishop uh, Toronto City Airport. They happen to be the most restrictive curfews so that we. Uh, if you'll allow me to finish talking, I'd appreciate it. Um, the, those curfews are the most restrictive curfews of any curfews that we have uh, at all 19 airports that we uh, that we fly into. But having said that, we are entirely mindful of the fact they serve a purpose and we're respectful of them. On a few occasions where we have, in fact, um, uh, had occasion to land a minute or two after uh, uh, the curfew, and those were in very, uh, very uh, um, uh, unusual circumstances, uh, we were fined and we paid our fines and uh, uh, it uh, reinforced for us the importance of staying within the time periods, and uh, we will continue to do so. It's small, convenient, and easy to get around. I'm concerned that the new planes increasing the number of passengers will change what we love about Porter. It's a statement. If it increases the size of the train, will it change what we love about Porter? And it's one that, uh, quite frankly, uh, when uh, our passengers indicated to us that they liked Porter, many of them said they actually loved Porter, but they wanted to fly uh, to destinations that were a little further out than the Q400s uh, could accomplish. Uh, they, uh, they also told us that they wanted a couple of other things. One, they wanted the same affordable fares that we uh, present within our uh, regional network using the existing Q400s. And last but not least, they made it very clear to us that they wanted the uh, level of service uh, that we're presently providing, and it is award-winning, 
uh, with our Q400 fleet and our dedicated uh, 1400 team members. They wanted that to remain the same, they wanted that to be maintained, and we are committed to doing that. For us, it's not about being bigger, it's about, uh, in fact, uh, responding to our passengers, providing some additional destinations at affordable pricing, and making sure that we can deliver that up with the same uh, level of, uh, high level of uh, customer service that we've become known for. That is our commitment and that's something we'll, uh, we'll work uh, hard at every day to accomplish. We can stay up, Robert. The next question is also to you. This is from a resident on Scarborough Road. You say this is not a mini Pearson. Are you aware that WestJet and Air Canada are bidding for their position on the runway? I don't know whether I'm the best one to answer that or not, but I'll certainly uh, uh, I'll certainly try. And uh, the uh, we're very aware that the uh, the airport is slot constrained. As part of our uh, intentions of operating CS100 jets from there, if we're given the appropriate approvals, we've not been told that there are any additional slots available. As a matter of fact, the Port Authority has gone out of their way to say that the airport remains capped at 202 and that we'll have to uh, better utilize the slots that we've been allocated. Um, the, um, the fact that there are slots or not slots, if any open up in the future, that doesn't in itself ensure, as I understand it, that any other airline will be able to come in unless they meet, as we will have to do as well with the, Q4, uh, with the CS100, unless our aircraft or unless somebody else's aircraft meets the very strict noise constraints that are set out in the tripartite agreement. When we did our worldwide search to determine what aircraft were available, we only found one. It happened to be the CS100. It happened to be Canadian. That was a bonus. Uh, but on the other hand, um, we are also cognizant of the fact uh, that uh, that is a high hurdle and we must meet it. Otherwise, uh, we're not taking the aircraft and they won't fly from there. The second thing, I guess, is that uh, uh, having um, uh, having an aircraft that uh, that maybe meets the noise constraints doesn't necessarily mean that it will meet the uh, uh, the uh, field performance uh, limitations that are inherent in that airport. It is not a uh, an airport with uh, long runways. It is an airport that has uh, adequate runways uh, 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 for the Q400. It is an airport with a very modest extension into the water at both ends of the main runway of 200 meters. Will be uh, very uh, suitable for the uh, for the CS100. But we also know that the 200 meter extension into the water at each end of the main runway is the absolute maximum that can be extended uh, in terms of that runway without impacting uh, the marine exclusion zone buoys. So one of our commitments was to. Uh, only take an aircraft that in fact could operate from there without impacting in any material way uh, boating activity through the western channel or in any material way altering the uh, position of those marine exclusion zone uh, buoys. We remain committed to that. What other airlines uh, do uh, and how they apply and whether or not they want to come in, I think that is a matter for Port Authority. And it's also a matter that's uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, um, uh, strictly addressed in the tripartite agreement, so they'd have to get slots, number one, and there's no assurance they would get slots. Number two, they'd have to keep the very strict constraints set out in the tripartite with respect to noise. And number three, uh, if they ever had any intention of a longer runway, just getting 200 meters without affecting marine exclusion zone uh, buoys, I can tell you, is not an easy task. So I uh, would uh, welcome them to try that, but I doubt that their aircraft would be able to operate from that runway. Uh, so that is the purview of the airport authority to discuss new entrants into the airport. Uh, we have, uh, as most of you are aware, a second airline operating commercial slots at the airport, another award-winning airline, which is very good news for this airport, Air Canada. Some of you may fly Air Canada, some of you may fly Porter, some of you may fly both. Air Canada serves the important Toronto-Montreal market with 15 flights a day. They operate the same Q400s 
the Porter operates. Um, the Bombardier uh, aviation business is an exciting business. As Mr. Kapoor said, it's a Canadian business. The Q400s are assembled right here in our backyard in Downsview. Uh, the CS100s, again, are a fantastic example of a, of a global industry, global parts, global design, global assembly, global marketing. Uh, we're excited by airlines that want to upgrade their fleet with aircraft that incorporate new, quiet, more environmentally friendly machinery and design. That means noise, that means not just outputs, it means all the things that all of us care about for ourselves and for our children and our grandchildren. Uh, at this point, uh, I would echo that Mr. Deleuze is actually correct in his assessment of where the Port Authority sits. Uh, within the very strict noise contour, the NEF 25, which you hear us speak about, uh, we have made a determination that at this time we do not have uh, the capacity uh, to add additional slots. The NEF 25 is the, um, the issue or is the guideline that is embedded in the tripartite agreement that determines whether slots can be made available. Now, an NEF 25 is a very strict restriction on our airport. An NEF 30 is a much more common um, measure for airports across North America. Uh, so we are a strict distance, so the likelihood of us being able to offer additional slots while still maintaining our desire to have medevac, which is growing, by the way. We have more medevac flights coming in the airport. Uh, that's partly due to population and partly due to the way that they're operating their, their organization. Um, and private and personal aviation, which is an enormously important historical foundation of this airport and has an important and rightful place in the airport. And um, any of you who've read our 2012 master plan will see how our designs are set to maintain, uh, or to ensure rather that we maintain a general aviation, private aviation presence at the airport. Uh, you mentioned um, both Air Canada and WestJet I would like to mention that um, Air Canada uh, has not indicated to us at this time that they would like to bring in a specific aircraft. Uh, we do have a commercial carrier operating agreement with Air Canada, so there is obviously a platform for us to have those discussions and we'd be delighted to have them with them. But again, it would be on the premise that at this stage we do not have any bread on the shelf uh, to offer, we don't have slots to offer. Um, but that doesn't mean that Air Canada couldn't change the way they wanted to operate with a different aircraft. Specific to the aircraft, though, I want to make this point very, very clear. The tripartite agreement restricts the total amount of noise that can be made on any given day under the NEF 25. It also calls for a minimum guideline or a maximum noise output of every individual aircraft that operates at this airport. That means every single aircraft that operates at this airport must meet the strict noise criteria of this airport, must be certified as such. So you cannot bring in uh, a late generation um, uh, you know, jet, if the jet ban is lifted, and expect that it would necessarily meet the noise criteria. In fact, to my mind, as I understand it, and through the consultants' reports that have been submitted to the city, it is not just an improbability, it is an impossibility. Those planes do not meet the strict noise criteria of the airport, could not operate at the airport for that reason, and the CS100 must meet, must get certification to fly at this airport. It must get certification to fly at this airport, not at any airport, for it to be successful here. That was one of the criteria I put up on the screen. WestJet was also mentioned. WestJet is a very fine airline, one of Canada's three greatest airlines. WestJet has not expressed verbally or in writing any interest specific to commencing operations at Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport. Thank you. This question is from a resident on Chris, uh, Christina Crescent. Um, why will the city, why is the city willing to ignore the statement of the Toronto Health Health study or body. So what we're doing now, and what was mentioned earlier, is that the executive still has to committee consider this report. One one of the reasons we actually deferred this uh, report was um, to get the health study back. So the health study is going to be done, looked at in conjunction with the executive committee uh, report on March 25th. So it's not we're not going to be ignoring anything from the health department. 
The uh, next question is, can you talk about the number of jobs this expansion has uh, the possibility of creating? Yes, I will. A thousand jobs at Porter, and probably up to two thousand jobs totally. That's uh, what the consultants have indicated, and that's in consistent with the numbers we also would uh, would estimate. <coughs> Okay, this is uh, from a resident on Claxton Boulevard. It seems a too big footprint is trying to be shoehorned into a too small and ill-suited Ill location. Why isn't the TPA looking at the outer harbor as a win-win alternative? There was, it's a very, very interesting question. Thank you whoever came up with that. There was a time uh, in history some years ago, where there was a contemplation of redesigning where the airport should go, where the port should go, and how the waterfront might look was many, many decades ago. Uh, we are in today's reality. Today's reality is that the airport is where it is, the port is where it is, the waterfront is being wonderfully redeveloped. We have a mixed-use uh, waterfront that incorporates excitement for leisure, excitement for residential, and excitement for industry. And the airport and the port are both part of that. Our job is to make sure that they are the appropriate balance in that scheme. Uh, the airport uh, has an agreement signed together with the city and with a third party, the federal government, called the Tripartite Agreement. It was signed in 1983. It's a 50-year agreement. And with the best knowledge that was available in 1983, um, the minds got together and wrote the best agreement, which is a really a collection of promises about how that airport should exist and how that airport should operate for 50 years going forward. That's two full generations. That's my generation and my child's generation. They did the best job they could and we're here now with 19 years left and we are appropriately, like all good people, asking smart questions around can we incorporate improvements that would make the airport better such that it can continue to exist and be a better compatible neighbor in the grand design of things. In the last seven years, some significant capital has been invested into that airport, all private, no public funds, no tax dollars. Thank you. Jason Coltman, 41 Pitch Lake resident. What distance from the airport does a plane travel before re reaching altitude? Seems to be a technical question. I can't give you actual track miles, but I can tell you that uh, uh, aircraft departing from Billy Bishop to the west uh, do a left turn out over the water, and uh, uh, if they're going off to uh, somewhere in the uh, to to the west, uh, um, they'll climb before turning on course. Uh, if they're taking off to the east, they in fact uh, do a right turn out again over the water and climb before uh, they do their turn uh, toward their destination, whether that's Ottawa, Montreal, or New York, or even northern Ontario. Um, Generally, uh, most of the movement is within a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, within the, uh, I, I think the, uh, probably fair to say within uh, five uh, or so miles of, uh, of the airport. They're generally, um, they're generally uh, descending or climbing within, uh, within a, uh, generally I would say about a five mile uh, uh, distance of the airport. but. I think in terms of uh, how far they are from the airport before they reach altitude, that's uh, on, any, on any one flight it would be different, or on any given flight it would be different, but uh, tough to answer that question without actually knowing uh, a little bit more about what they're, uh, what they're thinking and what they're looking to, to find out. What about the road from the west? Put it on paper. Okay, the, ne the next question is from a resident on Gladys Road. It says there is no containment system for de-icing fluid. Why not? 
I know that's uh, TO are absolutely incorrect on that. There is a containment system and it's adhered to strictly and uh, we support it and, uh, and the TPA and enforce it and make sure that it in fact is uh, carried out as for the, for the approved so procedure. If I, um, if I can speak, please, as the airport authority on that, um, there is obviously a containment system. We wouldn't be operating an airport without one. Uh, this does meet all the regulatory requirements. We do have an agreement with the city and is signed with the city. Uh, it is audited and presented to the city. Uh, it can be updated and has been requested to be updated and discussed to make sure that the containment system and the treatment of, um, of uh, glycol, the capture of glycol is sufficient should there be a positive vote at City Council. We're perfectly willing to have that conversation. It's a reasonable request. Um, there's no question in my mind that this is being handled properly. Uh, sorry, Ron, just before, um, while we're introducing people, I just want to acknowledge um, ben, Don ben Donahue from uh, the office of uh, John McKay, the local uh, MP is up here in the front row. Thanks for being here, Ben. Sorry, Ron. That's uh, fine. Uh, from David Lewis, Transport Canada said exclusion zones may be amended. Based on the preliminary data, what is the best guess for amending exclusion zone? Um, it's a difficult question for me to answer because uh, we've, we've had uh, a couple of submissions given to us preliminarily. Um, it, was, uh, it was probably, if I could describe it as a conversation uh, document given to us. I think the city was, uh, I'm not sure if you had the privilege of seeing the documents that were submitted to us as well. Um, we did respond to the TPA. We asked a lot of questions specifically around what we saw, and uh, but the, the documents didn't have all of the data that we would need to determine exactly where the marker would be in the ground, if I could use that to measure from. So it's difficult to, for me to give an exact answer on that. Um, well, I'll tell you what we saw from the, uh, from the TPA submission was based on the, uh, the data that was there, the, uh, the impact on the marine exclusion zones, yes, they had to move uh, more laterally, uh, uh, in other words, outwards from the center of the runway, or um, the thresholds of the runway, uh, but it appeared in those documents that it was a marginal movement. Okay, next question is from a resident on Sari Crescent, and it's from Mr. Deleuze. We've heard about the potential issues associated with Porter's expansion plans, including noise, pollution, traffic congestion, etc. How is Scarborough specifically affected, and what benefits can Scarborough residents expect to gain if our councillors vote in favour of the expansion plan? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, firstly, thousand jobs at Porter, up to a couple thousand jobs uh, totally, uh, including those indirect jobs. Uh, definitely you're going to have additional choice. Uh, not everyone wants us to come into that airport and I refer now to some of our competitors. We definitely will introduce more choice. Less of you will be inclined to drive to Buffalo in order to get some of the affordable fares that you would seek to places like uh, Calgary and Vancouver and uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, LA and uh, Florida and the Caribbean. And for those who want to go to Calgary or Vancouver, they're going to be affordable there as well. So there are a number of things. Uh, additionally, we promise, we commit to maintaining that same high level of, uh, of service. Um, I think we've already demonstrated that we're, we are a good neighbor, we're conscientious. Uh, additionally, additionally uh, what we've done to date has had an, an, an economic impact on the city of uh, about two billion dollars it's generated about 5700 uh, positions uh, direct and indirect uh, 1400 of those at Porter alone and uh, uh, the estimates by those consultants that were uh, that were tasked to look at this indicate another 250 million dollars annually in economic benefit and up to uh, 2,000 more jobs. So I think all of those things are, uh, are benefits that will serve Scarborough in all areas of uh, Toronto very well. Okay. Uh, 
this question is actually for the aircraft for their city center airports and are watching the outcome of the Toronto debate. There's potential for increased sales of this aircraft. What is No Jets Toronto's advice to those European airlines? You stepped out? Okay. I will go to the next question then. Would it improve or uh, increase the available slots for more efficient long distance flights and use in the future? Sorry, Paul Plansky. Yeah. Would it improve and increase available slots for more efficient long distance flights and use no. in the future? No, we um, let's let's be clear on that um, because this comes up. Just, just one second, please, sir. No, I, I, uh, I'll wait. There's a back page. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Egan. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Okay, would it improve and increase available slots for more efficient long distance flights and use of high speed flights, or sorry, high speed trips to Ottawa, Montreal, and could more efficient over shorter distances? Oh, God, that's my writing. <laughs> it's reading what you wrote, Mr. <laughs> As I said, my name is Kevin Hegan. Would it? Here is the question I ask. I'm thinking laterally here. Would it improve and increase available slots for more efficient long distance flights and use of high speed trains to Ottawa, Montreal, which would be more efficient, or which would be more efficient over shorter distances? It's a, it's a great effort, and I appreciate the gentleman's effort. I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, if it's a question of slots, there are no more slots. If it's a question of speed, I can't dictate what an aircraft flies at. That's not what the airport authority does. If it's a question of high-speed transit or trains or other options to other markets, that's for someone else. We don't do that either. So, um, you got my missing something? No. Thank you, Paul. Renee, 28 Bubank Road. Can you speak to the tunnel being built from Billy Bishop to uh, Union Station? Probably about the timing and uh, so forth. On how the imp impact of the, uh, the tunnel. So, um, the question was about a tunnel to Union Station, and I, I, I'm not aware of one. Um, <laughs> and I don't have plans to support one. <laughs> and I certainly don't have the money to finance one. So if it's about the pedestrian tunnel, which it probably is, with no disrespect to the questioner, then I'll address that one. Um, that project is a fantastic project. We broke ground on this in March of 2012. It is a pedestrian tunnel, not a vehicular tunnel, so you will be walking through it. You'll be taking elevators down. Uh, 10 stories, 100 feet, and you'll be going approximately 800 feet under the channel and you'll be exiting on the island side with a series of very dramatic escalators. Um, the tunnel is very unique uh, for an airport in a number of different ways. It's been followed by engineering groups um, and hobbyists uh, from around the world. You get regular phone calls of interest from various engineering groups. And the reason for it is it's a unique design, first and foremost, and secondly, um, it's being done on a public-private partnership model. And I think most of you in this room are probably somewhat familiar with PPPs, as they're known. Uh, 
They are often done for hospitals, that's correct. They're done for ring roads, highways. The 407, of course, is probably a, one of the better known P3s in um, our community. Uh, courthouses. Uh, but normally not for um, airport works and normally not for uh, tunnels. Uh, but certainly infrastructure and other types of infrastructure are very appropriate. And the, the beauty of a P3 is that it transfers the risk to the builder away from the owner. So if it takes longer than it does because of a really tough winter and some really tough ice like we have had in the last several months, and I don't know if you're like me, but I'm getting really tired in winter, um, that's not my problem. It's only my problem because it's not open for you. So it's my reputation that hurts, but not my wallet. Um, so the tunnel is a magnificent piece of infrastructure. It's going to open at the end of this year. We're excited about it. And we also are excited about it from the standpoint that what it does for the airport is it smooths out the delivery flow of people coming and going. Right now they bunch up trying to get across on the ferry. And that means everybody comes at once, arrives at a counter, leaves the airport, lines up, takes a taxi, looks for a car, takes a bus, whatever is available of their choice. This will allow people to come and go smoothly. And we believe it will start to encourage the investments that are going to be continued to be made in moving people onto shuttle and TTC, which is our desire. Thank you. Okay. Next question is, how can you guarantee that the marine exclusion zone does not change, making the inner harbour smaller and less safe, and taking away access through the western gap? If I may, Councillor, I think that's, that something, okay. that's something that should be dealt with by the TPA. And I'll address it to you. Thank you. The um, marine exclusion zone is set um, specifically for the needs of this airport, and the needs of this airport, first and foremost, are determined by safety. The marine exclusion zone will always be there for safety. The marine exclusion zone means that there are no boats, no boats, no boat activity, no traffic of any kind that can be in that uh, area that is marked off. Our criteria for conditional support of the port proposal, should City Council vote in favour, is that the marine exclusion zone cannot be moved in any material way such that it would impinge on the use of the harbour or the enjoyment of the boating community. The other hat that we wear at the Toronto Port Authority is a marine hat and we will not tolerate it. We've said it publicly and I've had it up on the slide. That is a serious criteria for us in consideration of this proposal. Within two years, why do travelers need a downtown airport? So um, that is a very good question, and it obviously was one that the city asked to be addressed by their consultants as part of the review. I was born the way I was born, I'm sorry. Please bear with me, I'm trying to... private platform, this is supposed to be inclusion area, it's not personal. There's a stack of questions and a load of people who come up there trying to the more heckling, the harder it'll be for us to get through the questions. No one should leave the Why don't we go on to the next question? Is that better? There will be a high-speed rail service from Pearson to Union within two years. Why do travelers need a downtown airport? Oh, part, of, part of our job is, is to look at... Yeah, part of our job is to assess... We have an application in front of us. Part of our job is to assess that application based on its merit. So, 
part, part of our role as, as counselors is to do that assessment. It's based on a number of principles. What's the impact to the local community? Uh, we want to make sure that the water fund is successful. So all those issues we have to address as part of the overall process. So part of that would be a consideration what impact is the leak from the airport? Uh, how does that impact the overall process? So that's part of our consideration when we make this decision. The application is in front of us. We have to address it as part of the process. And that should be done on its merits. Including existing infrastructure that has 65 airlines. Okay, next question is from uh, Portsmouth Drive or Portsmouth Drive. I saw a no jet flyer that had planes flying low over houses in Scarborough. Will the new jets fly lower over the city than the planes Porter flies now? No. <laughs> like those answers. Okay, now this is uh, uh, from Athlete Avenue. Why has your chairman of the board, Don Carty, been quoted that the CS100 will require 50 additional flight slots? I'll, I'll just repeat it. Why has your chairman of the board, Don Carty, been quoted that the CS100 will require 50 additional flight slots? Uh, to operate uh, 12 aircraft uh, to the destinations that we have in mind, it's approximately that number of slots. Uh, whether uh, slots open in the future, uh, of which there is no assurance, and TPA are quite adamant that at this particular point in time, there's no possibility of additional slots, or whether it's a better utilization of the existing slots that have been allocated to Porter, that hasn't been determined. I think we're focused right now on getting uh, approval to operate the aircraft first, and, and then if we have to uh, rejuggle the slots that we have in order to make our operation more efficient, uh, that's something we'll consider. But what Don did say, and uh, what Don Carty did say is accurate. It's something in the neighborhood I think he used the number 50, but it's actually closer to 44 or so that would actually be required to fully deploy, uh, deploy the 12 aircraft over the, uh, over the two or three year period. Uh, Todd, what assurance do we have that only whisper jets will be used by any airline in the future? Thanks, uh, thanks for that question, and I, I think uh, earlier we answered it specifically. The tripartite agreement uh, has specific guidelines for noise parameters of aircraft to be approved to operate, to operate at our airport. Um, so not any aircraft can operate, it has to meet the noise criteria within the tripartite agreement, and that will continue uh, beyond this point in time. Okay, the next is from, I believe, Red Bud Crescent. No Jets TO has said that improvements will cost $500 million dollars Will the city need to raise taxes to pay for it? It's a lie. As part of our uh, initial review, we tried to cost out what infrastructure would be required uh, to, to, to make this proposal work. And there's, there's two sets of, of infrastructure. One is called the air side. Uh, that's essentially the runway. Um, and any uh, uh, improvements required uh, for the aircraft themselves. That is a cost um, of around $100 million that would be paid for by the Port Authority. Um, the second set of costs, which is what we call the ground side, which is all the infrastructure required to get people in and out of the airport, there's a range of costs uh, there depending on what the volume of passengers is. So. Um, what our consultants did is came up with a number of different ideas from the very simple to the much more elaborate. So if you did add up all those costs, you would get in, into the $400 million uh, situation or, or number. Um, what we're doing right now is trying to figure out exactly what is required um, and by looking at not just a continual growth scenario, but what if the passenger levels at the airport were capped or reduced to keep it within a reasonable amount that would require less uh, infrastructure. 
So there's no real number at this point. There's a range of numbers, and confirmation of what the number actually is will be dependent on what the final solution is. Well, what, what we have said is, is any increase in infrastructure requirements direct related to growth of the airport would have to be paid by the airport and its passengers. So be the Port Authority. Uh, from Mystic Avenue in Scarborough. Why does the city not collect one rent, two taxes on approximately 64 acres of prime real estate? So we, we cannot claim property taxes on the Toronto Island Airport. I'm going to explain Pil Do you want to explain PILPS? So we cannot, we cannot collect property taxes on the Toronto Island Airport. It's actually, it's federally designated land. What we collect is called PILPS, or payments in lieu of taxes. We just went through a long, protracted negotiation uh, with the federal government. Uh, so we recently reached uh, an out-of-court settlement with them that for every passenger that goes through uh, the Tr Billy Bishop Island Airport, we collect 94 cents uh, per person. Moreland Reach, 202 Lawson Road. How will the sound levels be affected by jet versus prop air aircraft? So I, I think we want a comparison, a comparison of decibel levels between uh, prop jets and, and the actual uh, jet aircraft. I won't speak for other jets, but the CS-100 is the quietest commercial jet in production. It's comparably quiet to the Q-400. In some modes of uh, operation, it's actually quieter than the, uh, than the turboprop. So we anticipate that it will be a very suitable airplane for an urban airport such as Billy Bishop. Uh, the next one is from Scarborough Crescent. Scarborough, of course. Who will decide how high, how low, and to the flight paths taken by the jets, given that at, Pearson, that at Pearson we've recently seen that no level of government had the power or authority to stop or alter the new lower flight paths? Jeff, can you answer that at all? I'm gonna ask our representative of NAV Canada to, to respond to that, uh, Curtis. Uh, Let me just repeat that, uh, just so he knows what the, he's answering. Who will decide how high, how low, and the flight paths taken by the jets, given that a Pearson, at, at Pearson, we've recently seen that no level of government had the power or authority to step or alter the new lower flight paths? Um, for those who haven't seen me yet tonight, my name is Curtis Arnold. I work for NAV Canada, and NAV Canada is uh, in charge of delivering air navigation service to all of the flights that operate back and forth across Canada, whether commercial or private. And so the question is based on altitudes. The altitudes that we use for moving aircraft around uh, in and around the city of Toronto and indeed across the country are actually mandated by a number of different rules. Um, specifically in Toronto and specifically associated with Toronto Pearson traffic, we're prohibited from vectoring aircraft, which is to say a random movement of aircraft below 3,000 feet ASL, 
and the only time that they operate below that altitude is when they're either initially departing and they're quickly climbing to that altitude or on their final approach as they descend down to land on the runway. Um, we don't really anticipate any changes to those uh, altitudes or to the procedures we use for those flights, um, regardless of what does or doesn't change at Toronto City Centre. Good size regional airport out on the Leslie Steeds pit. It's a round better, it's a far all around better option. Anybody? <laughs> I think I think uh, most people would uh, agree uh, that the Leslie Street Spit is a, a very significant natural heritage feature in our city. Uh, has evolved into that. <laughs> has evolved into that over a number of decades, and uh, it's recognized in a lot of city policy documents. Okay, this is from uh, Dunnington Drive in Scarborough. The Union, it's a little long. Uh, the Union Pearson Express rail link will be completed next year at a cost of $456 million, a 25 minute trip, a train every 15 minutes. Pearson is under capacity. Why are we even having this debate? And uh, why is Norm Kelly pushing for early conditional approval? And why can't Porter fly jets out of Pearson? The Norm Kelly one, I am not too sure. I didn't actually ask him why he was pushing for a conditional approval, so I can't answer that on his behalf, and I don't know if either of you would know. We, we can't really answer for the Deputy Mayor, and similar to what was asked before about an application, you know, this is an application that's before us, it's a tripartite agreement. Um, as one of the three signers, signatories of the tripartite agreement, we have to consider every application that's brought before us. Next question. Eight, eight Eastwood Crescent. No one ever speaks of the benefits of Porter's plans. Are there any? about jobs, it's about Canadian aerospace, it's about uh, affordable fares, it's about alternative, it's about not being captive to any one carrier but having a choice amongst carriers and I think all of that points to significant benefit to the City of Toronto and to the traveling public. We're just sorting through questions. We have lots of them. Um, mention was made. Sorry, mention was made in late 2013 about a study being done uh, of other downtown airports in the world. What happened to this study, and did it make mention closing of the Edmonton and Montreal airports? So um, two of the city's consultants, the aviation consultant and the urban planning consultant, both looked at other uh, urban uh, waterfront or downtown airports um, and looked at some of the uh, policies that, that, that dictate how they operate and some of the restrictions in order to get a, a good understanding of what the, what, what the opportunities were and, and what restrictions we could put in place. So, that, that work is in the background documents that's on the uh, project website under the report by Airbiz, Aviation, and uh, Urban Strategies. And that was submitted as part of the report to Council. Uh, 
This is from a resident on uh, Lakehurst Crescent. Question. Porter has stated that 90% of the flights go over the lake completely, but this is just a snapshot of part of one day, and there were 30 flights directly over Bluffs residence. The question is, why is the flyer not truthful, and how can we believe it won't get much worse when it is already too noisy? stated that 90% of the flights go over the lake completely, but this is just a snapshot of part of one day and there were 30 flights directly over Bluffs residence. Why is the flyer not truthful and how can we believe it won't get much worse when it is already too noisy? So it's about the flight paths over the Bluffs. Again, I can only speak for Porter flights. Right today, uh, we have about 17 flights a day that actually go across the shoreline on a northbound uh, route. Those flights right now are uh, somewhere between four and um, and 10,000 feet when they cross that shoreline. They pose absolutely no uh, impediment, uh, no uh, interference with anybody on the ground at those altitudes. are well above any other aircraft that are coming to and from uh, Pearson, we in fact, uh, the flight paths are designed to in fact go over, uh, over top of those flights that are landing or taking off from, uh, from Pearson. So um, nothing will change with the CS-100s. Uh, none of those aircraft are actually designed uh, or, or planned for northern routes. They're planned for places like uh, Calgary, Vancouver, and Los Angeles, and, and Florida. So uh, from our point of view, uh, bringing on the jets uh, uh, will have, if anything, uh, less impact uh, than the existing operation. And the existing operation is designed specifically to not interfere with the enjoyment of those who are on the ground in this ward or in other wards that are, uh, that are along the uh, lake shore. How are the councillors going to vote yes or no for the airport expansion? <laughs> I think that I may have answered this earlier, but I'll repeat it. Part of our job is to look at the merits of the application. Yes or no. And part of that will be how does it impact our waterfront? Yes or no. Congestion. Is there, will there be congestion as part of this process? Uh, what are the environmental issues? What What are the impacts of expanding the, the uh, yes runway 200 meters on each side? So our job is to make sure that we take these, these things into account and, and make an informed decision. And we haven't got those facts yet. We still haven't got the study as far as the noise study for the airplane itself, which will be a huge factor in for me make, making a decision. So our, our job is to make sure we take into account all aspects of making, it's gonna be a difficult decision. So I wanna make sure that I have all the facts before I make that decision. I, as I have stated already, I am officially undecided at this point. I am waiting for more information. I have been meeting, speaking with my residents, and I can say in my ward it is a very divided issue at this point. So at this point, I can only say that I am undecided. Okay, and if I had to vote today, I would probably vote for the, the proposal to expand the Ireland Island Airport. Okay, the next question, if that's, what stops you from breaking this agreement from opening more slots to meet other airlines in the near future? Um, that's, a, that's a great question and uh, I'll answer the two parts. The first part related to uh, opening up the tripartite agreement to make amendments. Obviously there's three parties to the agreement. And anytime you're going to open up the agreement, there has to be uh, agreement and alignment amongst the three parties. 
On the second piece related to the 202 slots, we've talked about this uh, continuously. The NEF 25 is uh, what governs the airport and it governs the uh, total noise that being generated from the airport itself. Um, that, once again, we do not have any slots uh, available. The 202 will remain. And um, one, one point I was going to go back to, there's been a lot of questions related to the uh, Union Express um, and I thought uh, I'd take the opportunity to answer a little bit of uh, context on that question related to the Union Express. In the City Consultant's reports, uh, it identified that the uh, Union Express uh, would have no impact uh, at the Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport. That was in one of the City uh, uh, Consultant reports. I think one of the things that we've talked, we've heard uh, this evening a few times is the concern about the impact and we don't see it as an impact for our airport. The last seven years, Pearson has grown by almost 7 million passengers while this airport has uh, given passengers choice and we've been able to grow the airport to 2.3 million passengers. So we don't see there being an impact with the Union Express at all. It's customer's choice and customer demand to choose whichever airport they want to go to. Okay, the next one is, uh, how many more questions are left? <laughs> We have, we have 20 more minutes, we're going to uh, be filling that 20 more minutes. A little bit of levity. Okay, this is uh, on page 45 of the TPA Master Plan, Identify and Discourage Development. What area of de development would be affected by this? Oh, so what area of development for Transport Canada would be affected by this? I'll, I'll repeat it. On page 45 of the TPA Master Plan, Identify and discourage development. What area of development would be for Transport Canada would be affected by this? I don't think we have enough information to deal with that question. I'm not sure. We can come back to that. Maybe the person who wrote that question would like to see us afterwards, and we can deal with that offline. I can ask, I can ask right now. Actually, in your master plan on that page, you state that the Transport Canada would be affected Transport Canada, NAP Canada are going to have to get together with you guys to formulate bylaws or development uh, guidelines that would be strict in this current development. It's in your master plan. It may well be. I'll, you'll have to forgive me for not sleeping with the document under my pillow, but I don't know page 45. And I'm not sure what, can you just, which development are we talking about, sir? If, if it's heights of buildings, which I'm, I'm assuming that's what you're referring to? Um, the... The, the city and the TPA work together uh, specifically to um, A, protect the airspace around the airport, which is legislatively protected and regulated as such, and B, uh, to allow and work with the city to assist in the development according to the city's plans, according to whatever heights uh, and density that they are trying to achieve. So, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but there are regulatory inhibitions as to what you can build in and around the immediate proximity of an airport, and there, are, there is a process in place for the airport and the city to work together to ensure that development can take place as, as is planned. Or not. Okay, the next question is, can the Island Airport would have on the city and the waterfront will be considerable? Um, given this, Will the impact be studied by city planners and reported to council? Uh, the short answer to the question is yes. City planning is, is uh, one of the, the more active uh, city divisions looking at us. We're, we in the Secretariat are actually part of city planning, uh, so we look at this issue through their um, lens. Um, if you look through the report, there is quite a bit of, of uh, analysis on just what is the city's official plan policy and, and the central waterfront secondary plan, what it says about revitalization of the waterfront. And what we've always said through this review is we are trying to see if there's a balance to be struck between the airport um, and the city's objectives because um, whatever comes out of this, it has to show a net benefit to the city overall, not just the airport itself. So. Got a question from Emma. 
how high, how long will a wall along the lake shore at Yo Yo Ma's music garden be? Sorry, can you repeat that for me? <laughs> how high, how long will the wall along the lake shore at Yo Yo Ma's music garden be? Uh, a little closer. There's uh, there's no no plan to build a wall along Lakeshore Drive at the music garden. Um, there's there's no plan for any such wall. Okay. Uh, the next question is the proposed Pickering. If the proposed Pickering Airport is developed, will it provide an? It will provide another larger airport in the Greater Toronto Area. Has this been considered? One of the issues that we raised as city staff is we have we have a system of airports in southern Ontario. Right? We have Pearson, we have Billy Bishop, we have Hamilton, Waterloo, Buttonville's closing, Oshawa, and proposed Pickering Airport. And what we really wanted to understand is how do these airports work together? Uh, do they compete against each other? Do they have individual roles? So that's a question that we've tabled through our analysis and something we'd like to have a further discussion about, not just with our partners on the tripartite agreement, the Port Authority Transport Canada, but also with the GTAA and the other airport operators, just to get a better understanding of that very question. Uh, if, if I may uh, step in on this one as well, the last time I checked, because I was involved in the Rouge battle for many years, we're trying to get as many acres as part of it, so I've been briefed on the airport. It's within the 15, 30 year horizon at this particular point. Now the federal government, depending on the loading on, at, at Pearson, uh, will, will determine what the timing of that is. And there is an active group in that particular area that, that's opposing the airport as well. So at this particular point, it's within two, 10 to 30 year horizon, and uh, that, that will be part of our, our consideration. Okay. In the Toronto, uh, sorry, this is from Earswick Drive, in the Toronto Port Authority presentation, there was a list of things listed as needed to change. Would the Toronto Port Authority please go to that, to that and present that list? Explain that list, I guess. So we talked about um, what won't change and what will change. And specifically I talked about what won't change and these are the pieces that we've mentioned all night so I'll just quickly go to those. The NEF 25, the noise contour which dictates how much activity can take place at the airport won't change. The curfew won't change and the mix of medevac, commercial and private aircraft at the airport, the desired mix while it may fluctuate, um, no one will be excluded. Uh, what has to change within the tripartite agreement, obviously, is the lifting of the jet ban, uh, uh, which doesn't mean that any plane can come in, as we've talked about tonight. It's the lifting of the jet ban, but only those planes that qualify specific to the noise requirements of the airport may be considered for operation. Extensions to the runway um, will require an amendment to the tripartite agreement by all three parties. And um, as we understand it, some minor modifications to the marine exclusion zone. Uh, and again, as we understand it, those modifications purely on the sides of the marine exclusion zone, not lengthwise further into the harbor or further out into um, Western Cap. This is a four-parter. Um, I think uh, one of these may have been, uh, been answered at, at, at uh, one of the other questions. Has an independent body determined the noise levels of the jet aircraft compared to the levels of the noise of the present aircraft being used at the island airport? If so, in layman's terms, how do noise levels compare? If approved, can airlines that will be using the island airport use other aircraft with different engines? I think that one's been answered. If the present request is approved, who will pay for the extended runway and or the total renovations? I 
In terms of who pays for the runway extensions, that would be the Port Authority because it's on the air side. Uh, in terms of, um, the, I'm going to reread the question. Uh, has an independent body determined the noise levels? What has happened is um, Bombardier has done some, some in-flight testing uh, of the aircraft and provided data to the city. Uh, this data has, uh, I shouldn't say this data, the, the actual certification of the noise data has to go through Transport Canada. Um, so that's when, when you would have a uh, party actually certify what the noise impact of the, the aircraft is. And that, that hasn't happened yet. In terms of how the noise levels compare, each, each aircraft has a noise uh, level assigned to it, a cumulative noise impact, uh, based on three different measurements as the aircraft moves through its flight process. So that's the number that is in the tripartite agreement. It's also the number that's typically used uh, to evaluate the impact of, of aircraft noise among specific models. So uh, we do have preliminary numbers uh, for the CS100 that are in our staff report. I believe it's, it's very close to what the Q400 number is. Uh, but again, that's not a certified number, so um, it's, it, you can't say with certainty that that's what it'll end up being. Um, third question, can airlines that are using the island airport use other aircraft with different engines? Um, that's an unknown at this point. Currently, uh, other jet aircraft uh, of this size may not, or probably will not, comply with the tripartite agreement. And the various models of aircraft that are forthcoming that are using similar technologies are, are further behind in development uh, than the Bombardier C, C, C series. So they would have to go through the same testing that the, the Bombardier aircraft is going through now. So we wouldn't know that for, for you know, three, four, or five years from now. We have about five minutes left, so I'm going to try to get through as many of these questions as I can. This one has a lot another of major city in North America which has such an airport which affects residential communities located close to its commercial heart. And if so, do we know what, it ex what its experience is? Are there any other North American cities that have a similar airport to this, and what is the experience of it? In our, in our uh, view of the different airports in other cities, um, there are similar airports. There are London City, similar, uh, Stockholm, Broma, London, Belfast. Um, there are urban airports in the United States. But what we found is there, there is no perfect comparison between this situation and other airports. And the reason for that is um, there are airports on water, there are airports in urban areas, but there are no, there's no airport that is on a waterfront such as ours. And that's the big significant difference that our city planning council is on. Uh, these, these should be quick questions. Um, once the shovels go into the ground, how long will this project take to completion? By the way, that is if City Council approves it. So how long will this project take to completion if City Council approves it? So obviously we haven't done uh, all the work. Uh, we wouldn't do all that work in study and assessment until such time as City Council approved. However, in terms of conjecture, uh, first and foremost, um, we would um, we would um, come up with a design. The design would then be submitted an application to Transport Canada for approval. They can answer how long that would take. Uh, in conjunction with an approval of a design, we would then go into um, a process of environmental assessment, which we have undertaken in some detail with the City of Toronto to be a public environmental assessment with sufficient input. It would follow all best practices for this kind of work at any airport. And uh, it would engage, as you would expect, the same parties that we used in the recent environmental assessments we've done, such as, for example, the Lake Fill and the Tunnel Project, TRCA, um, Fisheries and Wildlife, and so on and so forth, Fisheries and Oceans, rather. Um, in terms of the construction, um, since we don't know what the design is, uh, it's quite a, uh, a range of uh, construction, but I would expect it's uh, several years. Um, so that would be my, my best guess. Uh, from a resident on Kingston Road, uh, this is to the Port Authority. 
Rumor is that Porter is in so, uh, serious financial trouble. Will the TPA audit them before building this infrastructure? So, um, I don't deal in conjecture. Porter pays our bills. They have an extraordinary following. I'm able to grow their business every year. Uh, it's a tough business, the airline business. I don't know what professions each of you uh, practice in your life, but I would uh, imagine that the airline business is certainly among the tougher. We're quite satisfied that we have two fabulous, very robust, and financially sound carriers at the Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport. Want to do one, sorry, one last question. This is from Lisa Popal. I read that the new jets have never been flown, so how do we know they'll they'll be quiet? The engines on the new jets have been uh, uh, certified since uh, a little over a year ago, so uh, the engines themselves contribute uh, the majority of the noise that comes from the total aircraft. Uh, so the noise on the engines is well known. Additionally, uh, Bombardier have done extensive uh, uh, static testing and, uh, and flight testing of the engines in terms of uh, uh, determining what those sound levels are. Last but not least, and from our perspective, this is an important one. Um, we know the uh, tripartite agreement has some very stringent noise constraints. We know that in order for us to operate that airplane from the Billy Bishop Toronto City Airport, that we must only we must introduce an airplane that can meet those noise constraints. We spent a lot of time with Bombardier. They guaranteed the level of noise on the aircraft would come in underneath those limitations that are set out in the tripartite. They backed that up with uh, performance guarantees, and in addition to that, we made it very clear to them if they didn't. Uh, meet the uh, very stringent criteria that are set out in the tripartite agreement, we wouldn't be taking the aircraft. End of story. We're going to wrap this up. Um, did Gary or Ron, did you want to make some concluding comments? I want to say thank you everybody for coming out this evening and, and giving us your questions. Uh, this is going to be a tough decision for us. Uh, we're still waiting for the final report on this. And we have a very unique waterfront. If the impact is too substantial, then uh, I won't support it. So, as part of the overall process, we have to look at the benefits as well. So, again, I want to say thank you, everybody, and for your input this evening. And I especially want to thank Paul for arranging this. He, he did all the, the work for it to, to put this together. And thanks, Paul, and putting it together. Too. And I also want to thank everybody coming out. We represent the three Scarborough Waterfront uh, wards, and we felt it was important that we come out to you to have an opportunity to listen to all the stakeholders, to ask all of the questions, and I just want to thank everybody for coming out. There are some more questions that we haven't been able to answer. We're going to attempt to do that as best we can. I think we caught a good reflection of all the questions that were asked, but again, this was the opportunity for the residents and our wards to come out to listen to this as, as uh, Ron has said, an incredibly important decision that we'll be making in April, and uh, I thank you so much for coming out, and I'll just pass it off to Paul to say thank you. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I know it's time to go on the screen. The screen starts going up behind me. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming out as well. Um, this is, is, as I said earlier, a very contentious issue. There's a lot of issues we still need to get feedback from, including the health study. Um, there's issues around traffic in particular on the, the downtown core that we need to hear back from. But I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, I think you know how to find each of the three of us if you'd like to bring uh, further questions or concerns. And I know that we will be more than willing to address them. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody in the City of Toronto, Transport Canada, Toronto Port Authority, Porter Airlines, No Jets, and Nap Canada as well for coming out. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.